We're at the next step on the next page, and this is the DC trigger level. This affects all four channels. This is the first time working with four channels. Um, we're going to run this in quad mode. This will be all four traces at the same time. And what we're going to be doing is basically getting these traces to sit right there at the very center of the screen in the center graticule and taking some readings. And we should expect to see that those readings, uh, which is going to be a voltage, should be zero. The tolerance for which is extremely small on this, we're really looking for extremely close to zero, which is, I don't know, kind of funny when, when you consider that you can't really tell how perfectly perfect you could get it to the center graticule. So I guess that's a little bit subjective. Uh, given the the nature of this and how specific it is, I, I got a feeling that I'm not going to be adjusting anything. This is just going to be a demonstration of this actually functioning. It's probably going to be okay, and I'm going to move on. It should come as no surprise, this oscilloscope, just barely being a four-channel oscilloscope, if only by definition, the flicker that you're seeing in the camera is pretty much the same flicker that I'm seeing uh, looking directly at the oscilloscope. You know, it's just what it is. And what I'm trying to do is take these four traces in quad mode and get them right over to the center graticule as part of the setup. So it looks like one trace. And that is part of the setup procedure. And I'm going to fine tweak this off camera and get this just where I want it. So just to demonstrate how this works, I'm going to use uh, uh, channel one to test it. I'm not going to test all four in camera. It'd be ludicrous. But channel one, the, the connector port to test is 15. So I'm just going to I'm set on millivolts and I'm going to test 15 here and you can see that it's showing 11 millivolts it's showing 12 millivolts but this is relative to exactly how exactly in the middle uh, channel 1 is so if I move the other ones out of the way and I found that it's easier to move them out of the way and do them one at a time so you could see just moving it a hair in any direction it's better, it's almost better to see, you know, if I, if, if, if I wanted it to be exactly eight, it would be so close that, you know, it wouldn't be worth adjusting. But right at the center, it's like 10, it's off by like two millivolts. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually adjust anything. This is good enough for me. I would test the other four, unless it was something absolutely crazy. I wouldn't make any adjustments. And quite frankly, we're finding that on this particular board, uh, there are so many differences on which resistor is what that you really couldn't make any adjustments if you wanted to. We're pretty much only checking at this point. And I'm going to check the other three now and make sure they're okay. Luckily, uh, the cabling, the, the test points seem to be correct, although the, the resistors are not. Test points 17 and 18 for channels 3 and 4 don't even exist on this board. And quite frankly, I don't even know where they are. So I can't even test channels 3 and 4. So one and two being good, I'm going to have to conclude this test and move on to the next one. The next step is virtually identical, except it's only channel one and is measured on pin 19 exactly at the center. It's showing three volts well within tolerance. There happens to be a pin 19 for this step, and I've confirmed it by uh, uh, moving the knob on channel one. So it is that one. So that step is good. Moving on to the next step. Here's another one you got to pay real close attention to to understand it requires three pieces of equipment, uh, two if you count the oscilloscope, obviously. You need a signal generator and a secondary oscilloscope. And what we're really looking for here is to inject a waveform on the uh, five millivolt scale into this oscilloscope on channel one, right? And the waveform is gonna be such that it's gonna be, uh, uh, I guess in all actuality, it's gonna be 10 millivolts because it could take up two divisions on the input and what we're looking for is that when we come out of the back of this oscilloscope right on the on the 50 ohm termination on the rear right it's going to come out of this unit and then go to another oscilloscope and the other oscilloscope is set to 50 millivolts and if this oscilloscope is configured correctly with the two divisions that we see on the input we should see four divisions on the output. Uh, if not, adjust accordingly. And that is the purpose of this. They also have a lovely diagram right here so we can see how these connections are made. Right there. 
and we basically have uh, the test set going into our oscilloscope, coming out the back and into the secondary oscilloscope for a product of two divisions, output of four divisions right there. Let's see what we got. So we can see over here, uh, coming out of the generator sine wave, uh, it's taking up two divisions, is 10 millivolts. There is a cable coming out of the back, it's going into the, uh, to the hand tech, and the hand tech is over here. And we can see that the hand tech, which is set at 50 millivolts, is showing four divisions. There's nothing left to do, this thing is set up just fine. Onward and forward to the next test. The next one was the adjustment of the channel one out DC level. And it's very much like the trickle levels done up top. I bring the uh, channel one uh, uh, clamp to ground to the center and then look at a value. And that value uh, happened to be on, on P21. And P21 is there. It says that it should be uh, less than zero volts, uh, plus or minus uh, 10 millivolts. When I measured it, it was actually 32 which is a bit excessive even for uh, me going uh, a bit lenient on this. And I said that I wouldn't adjust any more potentiometers, but I'll tell you that VR9 was sitting right next to that connector. And I said that, you know, in this case, there's a very good chance that VR9 is the right one in that case. And it turns out that I was right, and I was able to bring this one right back to zero volts. So this one was actually way out of calibration, and now it is perfectly calibrated. So I move on to the next step. Next step talks about square wave characteristics for uh, 5 millivolt and half a volt ranges. It uh, injects a 1 megahertz square wave into the unit uh, to produce a uh, 6 division square wave waveform, uh, both at 5 millivolts and half a volt and basically gives you a whole list of different, um, they look like uh, tuning capacitors, TCs, to uh, adjust at your own peril on this thing in an attempt to maximize the uh, perfectness of that waveform characteristic. I'll tell you right now, uh, given the quality of the square wave at one megahertz, and I'll, I did have a ring uh, forming at the, at the leading edge of the square wave, and I did make one adjustment on TC3 that pulled that out. And that was the only adjustment I made. I found no reason to make any other adjustments based on the diagram that was provided here. So anything else that I saw was irrelevant. So that's all I need to do. I've also been able to uh, make this adjustment at uh, 5 millivolts as well. Pretty much the same thing. Just doesn't look as pretty because it's 5 millivolts. Um, that concludes this uh, portion of the calibration. The next step is identical to the previous step. It's just done for channel two. The exact same thing, uh, but um, we're going to work with different uh, adjustment controls. Again, when looking at the square wave at 0.5 volt and 5 millivolt, we could see that uh, it looks really good. There's no need to do any adjustments on this. We're going to proceed to the next step. So I'm at the ranch and I'm picking up the shell for this uh, oscilloscope and it's been uh, redone with truck bed liner. Came out very nice. The uh, top of the MT665, uh, which was previously restored, uh, was in really bad shape. That has also been redone with uh, truck bed liner as well. And it also has new fasteners. Uh, the truck bed liner is extremely durable and uh, lends well to being in an auto shop. Uh, it is not paint. I mean, it's really hard stuff. So I'm going to bring this back, and as soon as calibration is done, it's going to be reassembled uh, with this box. The next two steps talk about the square wave characteristics using the five times gain. And this one talks about employing a uh, 20 decibel attenuator in line, and I imagine that so they could get a signal low enough that you could see it on the uh, using six divisions as shown here. And, and still be able to see six divisions at, at uh, five millivolts, still using the, uh, what is that, the five times gain. And, and I think that's the reason they do that. And uh, we'll see what it looks like on my screen. One of the problems I have is uh, one of the methods that I'm using to be able to, to get such a, um, such a, a low amount of, of voltage come through here. I'm not using an attenuator and I'm definitely not using a, a calibrated one, but 
I'm getting a bit of ring and that ring is only present when I use this method probably because it's not ideal. As you recall the attenuation that I'm using is uh, a resistor to ground as shown here. That being said if we look at the signal without the five times it's relatively small considering this is on five uh, millivolts you know did a tiny little thing and this is it you know multiplied by five and I think for a, a wave that's almost non-existent this is a pretty good characteristic considering uh, some of the noise I'd be letting in by that really dirty hack that I put on the other end of the cable. I'll call this good enough. We'll move over to channel two. Do the other one. I should further point out I could have gotten the signal even cleaner by turning on the 20 megahertz bandwidth limiter. So I wanted to show that here in this picture. This is with the bandwidth limiter on. Now I'll move over to channel two, keeping the bandwidth limiter on. This is channel two, also six divisions. I don't see any need to adjust channel two. That ring at the end is introduced because of the clutch that I've uh, created at the beginning of the cable. But there's nothing wrong really with the square wave considering the extremely small signal that's being injected into this. Moving on to the next step. This next step has to do with input capacity and Q ranges, right? And there are some measurements and adjustments and controls and it breaks it out in a list here as well as some setup information as to how it wants the device set up in order to accomplish this task. When I initially saw it, I saw the test equipment required was a 4343 Bravo. And I had no idea what that was at all. And I could be forgiven because I had to go and look up and figure out what the hell this thing was. And it turns out that this is a Q meter, a very expensive device. Uh, it's hard to come by and it's, I imagine in some form they're still around, but I don't have any laying around. I'm not going to be able to do this test, so I'm just going to talk about it briefly. Uh, some, some test points and adjustments and controls that are probably wrong for the specific card anyway that, that would require changing for, for ATT. And this is for channel 1 and channel 2, and there are some side notes here with regard to uh, some things dealing with overshoot. There's nothing else I could really say about this. I don't have a Q meter. Um, so that's it for, for this test. The next one we're doing is channel 3 waveform shaping. And we are putting together, uh, uh, basically we're using quad. So we're looking at all four uh, inputs at the same time. Though we're only really checking channel 3. And that's probably because it's the only way to do it. Everything else essentially is either clamped to ground or unused. And we're injecting a square wave at one kilohertz, uh, basically. And, and since there's no real way to affect the voltage per division on channel 3, it is being done um, by uh, adjusting the voltage of the um, oscillator itself. Though the uh, time division is set to 0.2 to give us the wave that we're looking for, looking for. And this is plugged directly into channel 3. It's set up for quad. Uh, the triggering is set to trigger off of channel 3 and basically what we'll have is our f uh, three um, other channels which I've pushed to the center graticule so we're not reading them and on the outskirts uh, three divisions offset from the top and three divisions offset from the bottom is the uh, one megahertz sine wave and that's what we're going for so that's what I have set up now well, let's take a look I should point out what I meant to say was one kilohertz, not one megahertz is what we're starting off with. And the uh, lines in the middle are just the other three channels. And what we're looking for is the um, the shape of the square wave on the outskirts here. And that looks just fine uh, for what we're doing. There's a little tiny bit of curve at the end, but I really don't care about that. And again, as, as most of the connections on this board are suspect, it's really not worth making an adjustment or trying to hunt it down for something that really looks like that. So I'm going to uh, go to the next portion of this and we'll take a look and see what that is. I've now moved on to step three in this where I've adjusted it to one megahertz and adjusted the time division uh, accordingly to accommodate that. Looking at one megahertz, we could also see it looks very nice. There'd be no need to make any changes uh, to this either. So we're going to call that finished as well. These efforts are essentially repeated again for channel four as shown here on the top. One note though, there is no A trigger source for channel 4, so you have to use the uh, um, signal in channel 3 as a trigger source and the B trigger source is channel 4. Couldn't find my other coax cable, so embarrassingly I used my oscilloscope probe off the T connector. 
I ran it down into channel 3 and connected it like this, but it worked good enough as a trigger source. It wasn't the signal side. And for all that effort, we got channel 4, which we could see right here. We also got channel 3, which I had to kind of move out of the way. We could see like channel 3 hiding here. So I had to be a little bit creative. But there's channel 4. Channel 4 looks good. So I'm going to move on to 1 megahertz. Here's 1 megahertz. It, it was a little bit harder to hide um, channel 3, which we could see up here. That's channel 3. But here's channel 4. And channel 4 at 1 megahertz looks really nice. Uh, definitely not going to do anything with that. We're going to call that good and finally move on to the next step. The next one again uses the 4343 Bravo to measure the capacitance of the uh, input jacks, channels 1 through 4. And I'll admit that uh, having the trigger sources set for what they were kind of threw me through a loop on this one. Because I don't know why the trigger sources would be set for uh, the input jacks, but whatever. Um, I don't have the equipment to do this, but out of basic curiosity I decided to check the capacitance of the jacks at the jacks. And I had to use a coupler to do it. And those would know if you're measuring in picofarads, if you're using a coupler, you've already lost the battle because you've added on significant amount of picofarads, depending on the jack you had to use, right? So I saw, you know, um, low 30 picofarads on jacks one and two, and then an extra coupler I had to add on the bottom, saw mid 30s. So I don't even know if that's correct because I didn't use the applied tool. And this is what got me right here. Be sure to make the adjustment of input capacity after making a one kilohertz square wave wave shape. Why would I be doing that? I, I have no idea. My assumption is this, and that is, is that the tool that's being used actually makes some sort of uh, square wave wave shape and takes a measurement at the same time, like it's an all-in-one device, and this is what you're doing with that device, and then it renders some sort of value. You don't stick a capacitor meter onto the input jack. I just did it kind of for fun. I can't do this measurement, so that's all I really wanted to say about that. The next one talks about the vertical axis here and setting it up. And it's pretty straightforward, this one. We're going to set it up on the scope. We're going to view it. And then once we have it set up right here, we're going to look at the overshoot. The thing is we're going to go through uh, every possible uh, voltage per division for each channel. And we're going to have to adjust the... Uh, frequency generator accordingly to maintain the six divisions. So I'm going to go through that. I'm, I can't do it on camera. I need two hands, but I'm going to make sure it's good. Here it is at uh, five millivolts for channel one. Before I adjust anything, let me bring it over to channel two. There it is, channel two. And there's five millivolts for channel two. Now I will check them both at point one. Here's point one on channel two. I'm skipping the other ones right now for the camera. I'm not going to show all of them. On channel one, I was finding some strange things at certain measurements. Uh, this is what it was looking like at some of the readings. Uh, other other uh, voltages per division were looking just fine. And then you'd run into something like this. And it took some research uh, to find out that there is some uh, capacitance measurements that are made here in this a switch housing on the left sides right here these holes and they have an effect on the the way that the sine wave is um, portrayed and it takes that that the curve out as I'll show you here so it is important that each and every one is gone through to straighten out that sine wave and I'm gonna go through all these very carefully on channel 1 and channel 2 and make sure that 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 bend you can see that looks kind of cool that that bend is straightened out on all of them. It actually took quite a while to sort this out and uh, get these things calibrated so that all of the different voltages per division uh, worked good on channel one. Channel two was solid, luckily. It didn't require any, uh, any adjustments at all, but channel one was really in a bad way and you had to go back and forth and one would detune the other. So it was, it was uh, a significant amount of work uh, uh, tuning these slugs here to get them just right, but it is done and it is completed and I'm moving on to the next step.